Ooh, not playing. Just like you Stop popping up and down With your arms to the side Then flap them up and down Like a butterfly And look and see If everybody Is doing it too Just like you And if we all do the same We'll all be together Moving around as one And if we all do it now We'll all be together Having a whole lot of fun Just like you Hello, welcome everybody to the Barnes Children's Literature Festival and here's the amazing Lisa Thompson. Yay! Hey, hello, how are you all? Um, we've had a little bit of technical hitches before we start, um, but hopefully you can see me. I'm here and you can hear me as well. Um, what a strange time we're in at the moment with lockdown. Now, we've been using a lot more technology, haven't we? We've been doing things like this, lots of meetings online. Maybe your schools have been doing things. And I'm just going to quickly share a funny story with you. One of my friends decided that her and her friends were going to meet on Zoom. Now, Zoom, if you haven't used it, is a bit like this, really, but you can see everybody and they all had a special code to get into the meeting when they were going to meet together and they were going to have cups of tea and chocolate and maybe a little glass of wine and they planned it all and they all put their codes in and they ended up in a business meeting in Germany. Suddenly all their faces popped up in the middle of a very important meeting in Germany and they had their cups of tea and their glasses of wine and they oh I don't think we've got the code right. So I thought that was quite funny. So this is what we're all kind of getting used to now, isn't it? Doing things a little bit differently. And this is my first time of doing a children or a literary festival live like this online with you. So I'm really looking forward to it, actually, because it's something quite different. I do lots of visiting um, schools and festivals and things, but I haven't done anything online. Where am I? I am in my little office in Suffolk, uh, which is right down in the southeast of England. And this is where I sit and write. This is a little kind of shed that we've got at the end of the garden. And I like to go in here. It's something we've only had um, put in very, very recently. So I'm really lucky. I've got no sort of quiet little space to work or pretend I'm working, which is a lot of the time. Um, and you can see my bookshelf behind me. Uh, I have a couple of awards at the top and then the, this row here are all foreign editions and my UK editions of my books. Then these two in the lower shelves, which you can't quite see, are all books that I'm going to be reading. So this is my to be read pile. There's a couple on there I have actually read. So you might recognise a few of those. Um, and this is it. Yeah, this is my space. That's my radiator over there because it gets quite cold in the winter. And this is where I sit on my own a lot of the time typing and writing my story. The book I'm going to talk to you about the most today is this one, The Boy Who Fooled the World, which is my most recent book. It came out in January this year. It has very jazzy edge to the paper, which I'm really pleased about. So it kind of looks like the spine, but that way round. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, the kind of the things that inspired me to write this book because that's one of the questions that authors get asked the most what where do you get your ideas from um, what did you how did you come up with the idea for any yeah different books so I'm going to concentrate on this one because ideas come from all sorts of places really so there's no kind of hard and fast rule with how to find an idea for a story and all of my books have come from different places. Um, my very, very first book, actually, would you mind putting on the first slide, Richard? Richard's in charge of my PowerPoint, so hopefully you'll be able to see the PowerPoint in a moment. Here we go. Fantastic, thank you. Aha, now we are. You can see my books that 
are currently published. So the Goldfish Boy is the one that I'm probably best known for. That was my very, very first book. It took me a long, long time to write it. And then I had The Light Jar, The Day I Was Erased, and Owen and the Soldier. Now, Owen and the Soldier is a really short book. So I'm going to just, if you see me in the corner down the bottom, hold up these two books, you can see the difference in the length of them. So Owen and the Soldier is really brilliant if you just want a quick read, or if you have, if you struggle with reading, if you don't think you like reading, you just want to read something nice and short. If you've got dyslexia, it's dyslexia friendly. So um, Barrington Stoke, who's the publisher for these books, I'm a big fan of these um, these books because I like quite short books. So that's that I'd recommend reading any of their books, actually. And of course, The Boy Who Fooled the World, which came out earlier this year, as I said. But it took me quite a long time to become an author. A very long time, in fact. And I'm going to show you some of the things that influenced me in becoming an author. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Richard. Now, I need to explain this picture to you. First of all, I am the one on the left. I'm not the one on the right. And also, this is me age four. Um, you might look at that picture and think, I didn't know, I thought this is the first time we've had lockdown and your grown-ups had to cut your hair. Can you see what my mum has done to my fringe in this picture? It's quite bad. And as you can probably tell, my mum is not a hairdresser. But for some reason, she decided she was going to try and cut my hair. And I have actually been cutting my children's hair during lockdown, but not something I would recommend. Um, the person on the right of this picture, I'm sure you will recognise, even though she probably looks a bit different to the, the person, the superhero you see at the moment, is Wonder Woman. When I was four, I was absolutely crazy about Wonder Woman. Now, Wonder Woman had a TV show. Every Saturday at five o'clock, she would be on the television and I would sit transfixed in front of the TV. And remember, when I was this age, I couldn't write or I couldn't read. I wasn't particularly interested in books at this point, but I loved Wonder Woman. So I used to put on my red Wellington boots, go into the garden and I would pretend to be Wonder Woman. And I would run around with my skipping rope, which she, she's she got. You can't see it on this picture, but she has um, a lasso, a golden lasso that she uses to catch criminals. And I used to pretend I had a golden lasso, but it actually was my skipping rope. And I used to run around the garden thinking I was her, making up stories, pretending to save the world, pretending to capture criminals. And I can look back now and realise this was my first experience of making up my own stories. I was already making scenes. I was having dialogue. I was creating characters in my head. I wasn't writing any of it down, but I was already making up stories. So this was quite an important part of my life. So I don't know when you're um, going out to break times or you're playing with your friends, or maybe at the moment you're obviously, you're obviously kind of indoors a lot more. Do you make up worlds yourself? Do you pretend to be a character in a film? Do you make up your own characters and your friends can play other characters? So that's the kind of thing that really helps to build up stories. It really uses your, well, obviously it uses your imagination and imagination is something we need when we make up stories. So it's a really good practice run to becoming a writer, an author. And I did a lot of this. I did a lot of pretending to be other people. I'm not kind of talking about acting or drama because I was quite shy, but just making up worlds and stories with my friends at break times and play times and things like that. So that was my first, when I look back, that was probably the first sign that I was maybe going to be an author. But you can, as I go on, you'll see how long it took me. So if we go to the next slide, please, Richard. Right, you can see here that I think my mum has probably taken me to the hairdresser because I've got a nice straight fringe. And also my hair's changed colour. I was born with blonde hair and my hair turned dark around the time this photo was taken, which was when I think I was about 10 in this picture. And something else happened around this time that's quite important and could have made me become an author as I've got older. 
and that was I wrote a poem. Now, in my class, in my school, um, we didn't really have a great deal of displays on the walls. I don't know why. I don't know if it's something that all schools didn't really do, but our teachers didn't really put our work on the wall. And I had, we all had to write a poem and we all handed the poem in at the end of the day and didn't think much about it. The next day I went into class and my poem and only my poem had been put on the classroom wall. And all my friends were saying to me, Lisa, your poem's on the wall. And I was like, oh, quite embarrassed, but inside I was like, yes, it's my poem. The teacher really loved my poem. I must be quite good. And my mum kept the poem for 37 years. Okay, so she had it in a drawer. And every now and again, she would say to me, Lisa, have you read this poem? Do you remember writing this poem? And I do. I remember it really, really well. So I'm really lucky that I can share this poem with you now. So if Richard can go to the next slide. You can actually see the poem. Now, there we are. It says at the top, Lisa Thompson, the 28th of February, 1983. So that was when I was 10 years old. And I think at the bottom, I probably run out of ideas for the poem and I just decided to draw a great big picture because I didn't to fill up the page. So I'm going to read it to you. My writing is a bit strange. This is the tale of Faye Doodle, who had a gigantic poodle. It ate 16 tins of meat a day and nearly ate poor little Faye. But soon poor Faye's big poodle died and his grave was 10 foot wide. She cried and cried all night and day because her poodle's gone away. So her mum bought her a cat, so now instead, she Loves That by Lisa Thompson, age 10. Now, I was incredibly proud of this poem. Um, as you can see, I think the fact that I managed to rhyme doodle and poodle was the highlight of the poem. And I use, um, I didn't manage to get noodles in there. I should have maybe got some noodles on something else that ends oodles. Um, but I decided to strangely, I was probably a bit strange, I drew a grave of the 10 foot wide poodle and a picture of Fay Doodle praying beside the gigantic poodle's graveside. But this poem and having this poem put onto the wall was a big deal for me. It was a huge deal. And it was around this time when I was 10, there's maybe lots of 10 year olds watching at the moment. Um, I distinctly remember thinking maybe one day I could be an author. And if we go to the next slide, I started to get interested in books. And here you can see some of my favourite books when I was a child. And I think actually you uh, nowadays have far more choice. There wasn't a great deal of choice of children's books when I was little. Um, but these are some of my favourites. Charlotte's Web. Um, now, a lot, so I get asked this question a lot as well. What is the favourite book that you've ever read? And I think it has to be Charlotte's Web, although I haven't reread it in a long time, so I need to reread it. Charlotte's Web is the very first book that made me cry. It made me absolutely sob. And actually, I read a book this week that made me absolutely sob. And it's been a long time since I've cried over a book. And I think to have that power, to have a book that's just words on a page in a certain order, that can have the power to make you cry is incredible. And I re remember, I distinctly remember crying, finishing Charlotte's Web and thinking, oh, that's incredible. How has it made me cry? How has a book made me cry? And it's then I realised how powerful books and stories could be. And then I went on to read books like Roald Dahl, lots of his books. James and the Giant Peach, I found particularly sinister and scary. The famous five books I found really um, exciting. There was adventure in them. And then I loved books about animals. So The Animals of Farthing Wood and Watership Down were not more of my favourites. Watership Down, I found very hard to read. It's a really big book. And it's not almost an adult's book, really. So I, I've kind of struggled with that one. But these are examples of books I'm sure you're going to recognise and maybe have read yourself. So it was around this time, as I said, age 10, where I thought, yeah, one day I'm going to be an author. 
but I had no idea how to do this. And I really thought to myself, my brain isn't big enough. I can't fit a whole book in my head and then write it down. Because back then, I kind of thought you had to know the whole book before you even started, which you don't. And um, I went through my teenage years, really enjoying reading, still kind of thinking maybe one day I'll be an author, but I kind of kept it as a secret. I kept it in the back of my mind. So if we go into the next slide, what I actually did instead was I got a job working for the BBC just by accident, really. I kind of fell into this job. I was very, very lucky. And I worked for Radio 2, which has lots of music. Lots of you might listen to Radio 2. And there's lots of I worked on concerts and um, shows with DJs that played lots of music. But I also worked for Radio 4. Now, Radio 4 are very speech based. And I was now getting into my 20s, going into my 30s, still thinking one day I'm going to write a book. And I was kind of writing a few short stories, but giving up and not not really taking it seriously. But the thing that changed for me is on Radio 4, I realised that um, there was a chance to listen to stories again. So I was reading lots, but I could also listen to stories because there's lots of plays and there's lots of stories on Radio 4. And those were the kinds of things that I was working on. And I worked in the studio, you can see on the left there, and I used to sit in a chair on the far left, that was my seat. And through that tiny window that you should hopefully be able to see at the back, that's where all the actors would sit. And I would sit there in that chair thinking, listening to these actors, listening to stories that other people have written, thank you, so you can see through there, thinking, I can do this, I can write stories, I can write stories, why am I not writing stories? But again, I would keep all this in my head and I wouldn't actually tell anyone. Um, and I work with some really cool people. If you go to the next slide, you'll be able to see some of the actors that I've worked with. Now, hopefully you'll recognise a few people here. We have um, Benedict Cumberbatch at the top who played Doctor Strange in Sherlock. We have Richard Griffiths and Imelda Stoughton who were both in Harry Potter. And along the bottom, these three actors were all in uh, Doctor Who and other things as well. But if you're a Doctor Who fan, you might recognise some of these people. So you can see I had a job that I really loved, but... I knew deep down I really, really wanted to write a book. And it took me a long, long time, but I did. I don't know if you want to put the, the PowerPoint to the side again, Richard. Um, I did write a book and I set myself a year's deadline to find an agent because before you get a publisher, you have to try and find an agent. And I managed to write The Goldfish Boy. When I say I managed to write, it took me years stopping and starting and changing things and going back and editing. It took me a long, 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 long time. And, but I did it and I managed to get an agent after a year. And by this time, I think I was 39. So from that four-year-old with the crooked um, fringe running around the garden to 39, it took me quite a while, okay? So it took me quite a long time to actually take it seriously and to actually do it. Now, as you can see, which I showed in the first slide, I've got lots of books. So once you start, you find you can't stop. So if we go to the next slide, Richard, I'm going to talk about this book, The Boy Who Fooled the World, and how I came up with the idea for this book. Because this book came from something that I saw many years ago. So if we go to the next slide, you will see, I'm just going to have some water. This is a boy called Kieran Williamson. And I remember seeing Kieran on my local news. Now, Kieran is a brilliant artist and he was discovered when he was only six years old. So he's really little and his teachers and his family realized he had this incredible talent and he carried on. And by the time he was 10, by the time he was 10 and I was, what was I doing? Making poems about Faye Doodle and her gigantic poodle. Kieran had made an estimated £1.5 million from his paintings. People used to queue outside galleries and camp on the street, camp on the pavement to be the first person through the door to buy one of his pictures. 
And I remember watching this news um, article, this news program about him. I wasn't a writer at the time. I wasn't, um, I was a writer, but I wasn't published. And I remember thinking, wow, that's incredible because his family were quite quiet and shy. And all of a sudden they had all this attention. They had all these news reporters and a lot of this interest in Kieran. And I remember thinking when I was trying to come up with an idea about a book, how about there's a boy who becomes famous because of his artwork, but by accident. So he's not like Kieran, he doesn't have all the talent, but he accidentally gets spotted, gets talent spotted. And this is my character here. This is a boy called Cole. Now Cole, um, his family kind of struggle. They don't have much money at all. And they're really struggle day to day. And Cole has a uniform that's a bit scruffy and a bit short and a bit tight. And he gets picked on a bit at school. He, he doesn't go on the school trips. And his friends it kind of seem to have everything. And then what happens is there's um, a famous modern artist, a modern artist I've invented called Marika Cole, um, Marika Loft, not Cole, Marika Loft. And she used to be a pupil at Cole's school and she comes to visit the school. Now she is a multimillionaire. She has um, houses all around the world. She has her own range of perfume and handbags and she has an art gallery in London. She's huge, she's really, really famous. And she comes to Cole's school and she, spots one of Cole's pictures and I'm going to read that part to you now so you can see what actually happens. So what's happened at this point because I'm going to read a little way into the book is that Marika Loft the whole school's been getting ready for her visit. Marika Loft has walked into the class into Cole's art class and she has given everybody a canvas they've all got a box of paints and they can paint whatever they want to and they're all a bit in awe of this woman and they're looking around at each other thinking, what do we do? What do we do? And this is what happens next. I'm going to start when she actually says this. So she's standing at the front of the class and she says, three, two, one, go. We all looked at each other. A couple of girls at the front slowly picked up their canvas and paints and stood up. That's wonderful, said Marika. You might choose to change your perspective to get the picture you want. Sit on the floor, stand on your chair, climb on your desk. Archie immediately stood on his chair and Hannah got up onto her desk and sat right in the middle. There was a moment of chaos as everyone started laughing and climbing over the furniture. But Marika just stood there smiling. I walked around the room trying to find a space where I could paint something, but all the best places were taken. I went to the back of the class and sat on the floor, leaning up against the wall. The sun was beating against the window and I turned my head to stare outside. The sky was the colour of a Caribbean sea and there were two aeroplane vapour trails that crisscrossed each other like a giant kiss. From my box, I took out a little plastic dish. I squeezed out a few centimetres of bright blue paint and a bit of white, and I used my brush to swirl them together. The blue lightened just like the colour of the sky. Then I pressed my brush against the canvas and began to paint. I was aware of the distant chatter of my classmates and the sound of Marika's heels tapping on the wooden floor as she walked around the room. But for most of the lesson, I was utterly absorbed. The white vapour trails in the sky I had to try and remember what they looked like as I dabbed my brush onto the canvas. It was now entirely blue, apart from the two wispy white lines cutting across the middle. Is that it? said Niall, looking over at my picture. That's so boring. You can't just paint the sky, said Kiki. You've got to put something in it. I could see Marika walking around the class, nodding and smiling at everyone else's work. This was a disaster. I picked up my picture and held it at arm's length to get a better look. I decided to quickly paint a tree on one side, but when I put it back on the floor, I realized I'd accidentally made handprints in the wet paint on either side of the canvas. You could clearly see my thumbs and the outline of my hands. I'd ruined it. 
I grabbed my brush and dipped it into the blue paint and was just about to paint over the handprints when someone shouted, stop! I froze, my brush poised in the air. I looked up as everyone turned around to see what was going on. Marika stood in front of the window, staring directly at me. Don't touch it, she said, her eyes wide and bright. She lowered her voice. Have, have you painted before? I shook my head. A great blob of paint fell off my brush and onto the canvas. I went to rub it in, but she waved her hand at me. Leave it, leave it just as it is. Put your brush down. I looked around the class. Everyone was watching. What's your name? asked Marika. Um, Cole Miller, I said, gulping. I can see it. I can see exactly what it is you were trying to do, she said. You can? I croaked. I looked down at the canvas again, the canvas covered in bright blue paint with two handprints on either side. Marika nodded. This is you, isn't it? The blue is you. You're holding your life, your world in your hands. I looked back at the painting. She must have been talking about my fingerprints on the side. Oh, that's just where I picked it up and accidentally... It's... It's... interrupted Marika, placing her hand on her heart. It's incredible. It's telling me a story. It is, I said. She nodded. It's a picture that really speaks to me. It makes me want to ask questions. Right, I swallowed. Just then, Marika's PA walked into the classroom. Marika stood up. Declan, get this painting into the car. We're taking it back to the gallery. You are? I said. Marika looked at me. Yes, but first you need to sign it. What do you put? What do I put? I said I'd never signed anything in my life. Marika smiled at me. Just put what comes naturally, she said. I stared at the painting, dipped my brush into a darker shade of blue and did a curly C in the corner. That's perfect, Marika said, still smiling. Would you like to give it a title as well? Um, a sky in blue, I said, gritting my teeth. It sounded like a dreadful title to me. That's perfect, said Marika again. Declan reached down and picked the canvas up using just the tips of his fingers. Be careful, Declan. That picture is very precious, said Marika. I was stunned. My painting, precious. Um, what's going to happen to it? I said. Marika placed her hand on my shoulder and whispered into my ear. We'll see, shall we? She said with a mysterious smile. So that's the point where things start to change dramatically for Cole and everybody is interested in this amazing artist and he becomes famous. One of the paintings that he sells, sells for an incredible £100,000. But there's a problem. Cole has told a lie. He's told a white lie and there's a twist in the story and everybody finds out what he's done and then he has to try and make amends. So if we go to the next picture, please, Richard. Um, in Cole's local museum, there is uh, a picture, a painting, and I've invented this painting. It doesn't exist, but I based the research on my local museum in Ipswich. So this is a picture of my local museum. And in the painting, it's like a treasure hunt. And there's lots of hidden clues. And Cole and his friends decide to try and make amends for what Cole's done. If they can solve the riddle of the painting, it will lead them to a treasure. It's an old story. It's an old painting. Nobody's ever been able to solve it. And he decides that that's what they're going to try to do. They're going to try and solve the riddle of this painting called An Enigma in Oil. And while I was researching this, I found some interesting things about some other pictures. If we go to the next picture, some of you might have seen this picture. Now, this is a painting called The Ambassadors by Hans Holborn the Younger. It was painted in 1533. And so that was in the Elizabethan times. And you might look at this painting and think, mm, it's not particularly interesting. Maybe it is. There's two men. They've got lots of bits and pieces behind them. But there's a very strange shape at the front of the painting. There's this kind of blob. Now, this, I believe, is one of the first examples of an optical illusion. And I saw this painting in the National Gallery in London and I was blown away. I thought it was incredible. And what happens is if you stand straight on at the painting, it looks just as it is here. But if you move to one side, that blob at the front 
reveals exactly what it is. So if we go to the next picture, the next slide, there, can you see what that strange shape is? It's a skull. And I remember this is actually when I was in the gallery, I took this picture myself. So you can see, you can see what it is. And I thought, this is brilliant. It's really hundreds of years old. And this painter has created an optical illusion. And if we go to the next slide, you'd be able to see the two, um, the blob compared with the skull. So you can see when you kind of, when you know what it is, you can probably see it a bit clearer. So I use that. I stole that idea and put that into my book. So when Cole and his friends are trying to solve the picture, this mysterious treasure hunt, they see a painting. Um, that while they're looking at the painting, they see something from a certain angle. So I've kind of used that. And there's lots of other clues that you can try and solve as you read along. OK, so we go to the next picture. Now, I do lots of these talks in schools and in festivals and things. And this is my favourite part. So I'm hoping this is going to work, although I haven't got any can't actually hear any of you um, but this is an art quiz because when I was looking into the world of art there's some very strange paintings out there and I want you to decide whether you think this art is real or something I've made up so we go to the first one have a little look some of you are probably watching this at home maybe with your families or your friends or your grown-ups or in your classrooms so the next picture here we are. Now, do you think this is a valuable piece of art? So if you look at that and you think, hmm, not really sure. Did Lisa make that up? You know, I don't know. She could have done it on a computer. Have a little decide. What do you think? OK, right. Let's have a look. So the next slide, please. It is valuable. Now you can see the artist at work. I thought this is a brilliant story. This is a chimpanzee called Pierre Brasseau. And this was something that happened in the 1960s. Somebody decided to try and test the art critics and they got a chimpanzee to paint lots of paintings, had an exhibition and didn't tell anyone who had done the paintings. So it is a valuable picture. There is a collector that, that has this, this piece of work. How about the next one, please? The next art. How about this? I mean, it's a very strange world, the art world. Very strange, but very, very entertaining, great fun. Could this be a valuable work of art? Have a little think, could it be? And I would say, uh, it's a fake. Yes, it is a fake. Sorry, it was in another slide to that. That is a crisp I found with a smiley face on. Okay, the next slide, please. How about this one? Do you think that could be, I'm looking at your comments now. I didn't have your comments box open. Some people are saying no, some people are saying yes, Demet's saying yes, some people are saying fake. I'm afraid it's fake. This is a chalkboard. I took a photograph of a chalkboard and made it look like a picture. Okay, and my favorite, oh, and this isn't my favorite one. Next one, please. How about this? Is this a valuable piece of artwork? It looks a little bit spooky, I think. Somebody said no. Now, this one is, in fact, I can tell you, I've got it written down. This is the first piece of artwork created using artificial intelligence. So this was basically painted by a robot and it sold for $432,500. I think, yeah, it is a valuable piece of work. And the last one, please. Richard. Okay, how about this one? Now, do you think this banana that has been taped to a wall is a valuable piece of art? Did I just do this? Have I just taped a banana to the wall and decided to take a picture? Whoa. Now, this was on the BBC News recently. That will give you a clue. It is a valuable work of art. And this is actually called Comedian. It's by a man called Maurizio Catalan. And it sold for $120,000. But then what happened was another artist came along and decided to eat the banana. And if we go to the next picture, you'll be able to see a man eating the banana. And he called this a work of art. So if we go to the next picture, please, Richard. Thank you. Um, you can see the art world 
is a really fun, strange, crazy. I love it. I think it's brilliant. It's it provokes um, discussions, and there's a lot about it in my book. There's a lot of opinions on art, and you see Cole's reaction, and things um, kind of. Yeah, it might get you to look at pictures in different ways. So here, very quickly, are some of my favourite paintings. This one I think is beautiful. This is carnation lily lily rose. Then we have, sorry, <laughs> then we have Vincent van Gogh. I'm sure you'll recognise this one because um, I get lots of cheers when I show this picture in, in schools. I'm a big fan of Vincent van Gogh. And then the next picture is um, by a lady called Jelly Green, has a really cool name. Now, Jelly Green is a young artist and she travels all around the world. She goes to Amazon rainforests and jungles and forests in the UK and, and paints pictures, takes her paints and canvases and paints pictures. So there we are. So if we go to the next slide, thank you very much. I'm gonna quickly tell you about my next book, which is coming out, which is another book um, like this size, a small book. Now, this is now coming. It was supposed to be out this month, but the House of Clouds is coming out in September. I think middle of September now. So we pushed it back because of lockdown. And it's my first book with a female lead. My, I've written it from the um, point of view of a girl called Tabby. And it's all about, you know, when you look in the sky and you see a cloud, it looks a bit different it looks like a boat or it might look like a bear with a top hat Why, where have they come from those clouds so there's a little bit of mystery in there um and that book comes out as i say in september okay and i think i've got one more slide which just shows you my details i've got a website which you can get in touch with me on instagram and twitter so i think Hopefully we've got time now for some questions. And I think Dermot is going to let me know what the questions are. And I should close this down. Hello. Hello. That works, hopefully. Um, we actually yes. had a question while we we're on the topic of that. Um, someone has asked where all or your main characters are boys? That yes. question is from Anita. Uh, thank you, Anita. I, I get asked this a lot. Now, the, the, big, the main answer is I don't really know. I don't deliberately write from a boy's point of view. I think what's happened is, and I've heard other authors say the same, is that an idea can come to you with a character already in mind. So all of my books so far, that's what's happened. And for The House of Clouds, my next book, which it came to me with this idea about a, um, a girl who sees clouds in the sky. And it just came with a character, a girl character. And the next book that I'm writing, which is another big book, also has a female as the main character. So it seems to come with the story. So I don't deliberately set out to do one or the other, really. But I always have strong female characters in my books. So all of my books have there were girls in there that were very, really crucial to the to the part. And likewise, for the girl character, there's always a boy character kind of in the background as well. So that's kind of how I like to write. Fair enough. Um, that also brings us to Poppy's question, who asked, so basically how do you get your inspiration for what to write? And like, she asked, especially asked for Goldfish Boy, and has asked if right. you had any similar experience to Matthew or how did you get yeah. to this? No, okay, yep. Yeah. So The Goldfish Boy is about a boy, if you don't know, it's about a boy called Matthew who's here with a goldfish ball over his head. And he has a condition called OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And he is absolutely terrified of germs to the point where he won't go to school. And he washes his hands until they, they are cracked and sore and he wears gloves and... He, um, it's a condition that lots of people suffer from. I don't have OCD and I didn't have any experience of the condition before I wrote the book, but I knew I wanted to write a book about a character who for some reason stayed in their bedroom or stayed in their house and didn't like to leave that space. And I went through lots of kind of um, scenarios. Well, why, why won't Matthew leave his house? And I happened to see a documentary on Channel 4 and it was all about OCD. And I kind of 
misunderstood the condition before I saw that documentary. I didn't really understand how it worked or how debilitating it could be. And I watched that program and it changed my mind. It changed my whole view on how I've kind of empathised with people that had it. And then I knew that I wanted my character to have OCD. And I then did lots and lots of research. I discovered one of my friends has OCD and I didn't know. And so he kind of helped me with a lot of the story. I spoke to a psychologist who deals and helps young people with OCD. So I did lots and lots of research then. So um, that's where the story came about. And then the, there's a boy who goes missing. So sometimes lots of people ask me, had I had that experience but I haven't either but there's lots of my life in this book there's lots of um the street where it's based called Chestnut Close is based on a road near where I used to live and the houses are kind yeah. of set out the same so I use a lot of my memories in these books as well um we also have the question of why do you ask it, uh, why do you write in first person oh that's um, a good question um I find it easier to write in first person. Well, I say I find it easier. Sometimes it can be a bit hard um, if you need to get somewhere with the story and you need your character to go there because your character's telling the story. But I like reading in the first person and I like writing in the first person. I might try and write a book in third person one day. Um, but I just find it easier to get into the character, into the character's head. I find it's easier to write a story um, that people can understand if you're right. Like I start to understand the character more and therefore my readers hopefully understand the character more. So first person I'm a big fan of. Thank you. Fair enough. Um, we actually had a really cute question. I can't find the... Uh, oh, there it is. Will has asked, did you have a light jar when you were little? Oh, thank you, Will. Um, I didn't. I have one now, actually. I At an event, a friend, um, a, daughter, a little girl turned up with a jar with some, a string of lights in. And but I didn't have a light jar. And it's kind of, um, so the light jar, for those who don't know, is this book here. And Nate, my main character, is frightened of the dark. And because he's about 12, he doesn't, you know, there's plug in night lights that you get. He doesn't want one of them. So his mum makes him a light jar that he has on his shelf to kind of give a glow to the room at night time. And um, so I didn't have anything like that. And I remember my children having plug in night lights. But I knew because he was older, he wanted something a bit special. So um, that's how I came up with the light jar. That's a really cute idea. I yeah, want and now. I keep seeing them everywhere <laughs> on light jars. <laughs> I wish I'd invented them, but I had them. <laughs> we have a really specific question mm. uh, from Hannah, and she's asking, in your book, The Goldfish Boy, there's a short story near the end about a boy called Timothy in his bright orange bobble head. What is the moral of the story and why did you decide to put it oh, in the book? Thank you, Hannah. Yes, there is. There's a story about a boy who I think it's um, Matthew goes to see a therapist and she tells him a story about this boy who, and I, this is terrible, I can't really remember it, but I remember that I got the idea from um, a story that I'd read about on an OCD website. And it was, it was kind of like, the, from what I can understand with OCD, if you do something you keep doing it because you to stop a bad thing happening that was the moral of the story so the boy with the the red bobble hat kept wearing this bobble hat to school because if he wore this bobble hat it would kind of give him protection from things and that was kind of getting Matthew to think along those lines so I'd kind of twisted it a bit it was a story I heard about and um and the story was because he wears his bobble hat, these things weren't happening. So therefore it must be to do with his bobble hat and it wasn't. So I think it was something along those lines. I'd forgotten all about that passage. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> That's the trouble when you write, you, when you're onto the next book, you forget about the book you've just written very quickly. <laughs> do you ever reread your books? Um, I don't ever reread my books really. I've kind of um dips into them sometimes and I very easily forget the characters names um and I yeah and I read 
parts in school. So every time I've got a new book out, I pick a passage to read, or sometimes I read from the very first chapter. Sometimes like I did just earlier, I read in the middle. So that's nice to do, but no, I don't really really read my books. Um, the, we haven't really talked about your like writing routine now that you're a full-time mm -hmm. writer. Um, and Iris is asking if there's a specific time you write. Ah, oh, good question, Iris. Now, I, I'm a morning person. I'm one of those annoying morning people. And I'm in bed quite early. And I write, I find the morning the best time to write, really. So I tend to, when we weren't in lockdown and my children would go off to school, and I would tend to try and write between nine, half eight to nine o'clock-ish until, and then kind of after lunch, I'm struggling a bit. My attention has gone off into other things. So I tend to try and write or edit, because editing is a lot of write, you know, when you're writing, you're going over and over the book. So there's a lot of editing, editing to be done. Um, I tend to do that between, I'd say, nine and two o'clock. And when I wrote The Goldfish Boy, I had lots of other jobs and I was juggling different jobs and I was um, taking children to school and things like this. And I, this makes me sound like I'm mad, but I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning and write <coughs> into, until seven. So between five and seven. In the morning, I used to write The Goldfish Boy. And I think I didn't do it very often. It makes it sound like I did it every day of the week, but I did it a handful of times. But I found because I'd made so much effort to get up at that time, I wasn't going to waste it. And I wrote for those two hours before the family got up. And I was found that to be a very productive time. And it is hard. And I know some authors write through the nights. They'll stay up late and do it. But I, I tend to find the morning better. Yeah, that is so not what I would have done. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, um, That's the thing. You have to find what, what works for you, really. And I think there isn't any rule of, you know, you've just got to find what, what works for you. Because if it doesn't work for you, you're you're unlikely to carry it on. Right. Fair enough. How has quarantine then changed your writing routine? Like, yeah. Oh, I think we've lost connection there with Demet. Um, so the question was about my how things have changed in quarantine. And I'm finding to start with, I found it really hard to concentrate on anything. So I'm writing another book. I'm editing another book at the moment. And I found that if I yeah, I kind of wasted the day. My children are at home, so I'm chatting to them. They're teenagers, so they're kind of getting on with their own work but I would get easily distracted. Now I'm I'm kind of being set in a bit more of a routine so I kind of know what I'm doing. So hopefully Richard's there, which is going to find another question. Is that okay, Richard? Oh, yes. Can you hear me, Lisa? I can. I can oh, hear you. I excellent, think Demet excellent. lost the connection. Oh, yeah, Demet sounded, she, she dropped out a few times there, but she'll, she'll be back. We know Demet. She's very determined. Um, <laughs> we've, got, we've got some lovely questions here. So and, uh, I know that Demet asked some nice ones. Uh, here's a good one. It's the, the top vote at the moment. As a writer, what animal would you choose as your mascot? That's a really good one. What animal would I choose as my mascot? I think I would probably choose a dog. We don't have a dog. I'd love to have a dog. We have a cat called Ziggy. And I was hoping he would be around, but he's not because I can show you. And he is a bit like a dog in that when we go for a walk, he comes with us and he trots along and he gets very excited. So actually, maybe Ziggy should be my mascot. Yeah, I'll change that. I think Ziggy should be the mascot um, because he is a character and he would love that, I think. Oh, uh, yay for Ziggy. Yay for Ziggy. Um, uh, some of these questions uh, we, we have asked, but there, there are, I guess there are sort of little nuances that people would like. They'd like to know. So you spoke about your poetry as ten-year-old Lisa, <clears throat> which we mm -hmm. all loved. But how old would you? How old were you when you found a real love for for reading and writing? Do you think that really set you on the path to being an author? I think that's a really good question. I think I started. So I was reading those books that I showed you the picture of when I was around ten, and then when I became about. 12 or 13 maybe 13 yeah older than 13 that was a time I couldn't stop reading I absolutely loved reading and I was then kind of reading um again like I mentioned at the beginning there wasn't a huge range of books 
there wasn't YA books like young adult books when I was little. Um, but I kind of read lots of um, the books that were there. Then I went into reading adults books and teenagers books. And that was when I really started loving stories. But also I was really influenced by television and film, like the stories that we see around us, the stories that we see on the screen, they're still stories. And I especially loved ones with twists in them, a story or a film where you just didn't see something coming and you thought, oh, I really didn't see that coming. That's brilliant. And it kind of gives you goosebumps and um, you get a tingle down your spine. And that's, I distinctly feel that's what I try to do in all of my books. I always try to have something to, to surprise the reader because I love that feeling when I'm reading or watching something. That's something I love doing. Um, and what another thing I've, I haven't mentioned is that before I wrote a book, before I wrote The Goldfish Boy, I wrote short stories because I couldn't I didn't think my brain could hold a whole book in it. And you don't have to know the whole book but I thought you did. So I started with short stories and I wrote lots and lots. I wrote 13 short stories and they all had a twist in them. And one of those stories was about a boy called Matthew who didn't like to leave his bedroom. So that short story, I then expanded into a novel. So I started off with little bits and when I put them all together, I realized, well, that's the length of a book. Maybe I can write a book. Maybe those short stories can be chapters in a book. So um, and that was when I was in my 30s by this point. But I, yeah, it kind of took me a long time to be brave enough to do it and to commit to myself. Oh, OK, I just when you were at the twist, that's interesting. Did, you said earlier that you, you didn't necessarily have your whole book in mind when you set out to, to write. Did you have the twist in mind? Was that what you built your story around? Sometimes there is that. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, the day, no, actually, I wouldn't say I do know the twist. I'm thinking back on all of them. And the day I was erased, there was there's a twist toward the end, and I was right at it, and I suddenly, thought, yeah, brilliant. I came up with an idea, and <laughs> so that definitely happened while I was writing. To be honest, I think the majority of them, the idea comes while I'm writing, and I've got it in the back of my mind that I want to do that, and then maybe that helps as well. Do you think that as you write your your stories and get to know your own characters better, that 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 gives you the twist? Yeah, definitely. And I think some authors like to kind of research their characters beforehand and plot them. And you'll probably see you can do exercises where imagine your character is on a plane or oh, doing this and this happens. How do they react? And you get to learn about your character by doing those kind of exercises but I definitely learn as I write as I'm writing really um and I discover them and yeah that's so I don't do I do the minimal amount of research that I can because I like to throw myself into the book and start writing and find out things along the way but you do need to do some planning and research but um most of the time I'm discovering a lot on along the way well, it sounds like you did a lot of research at the museum and so on as well. So, yeah. So, so yeah. Away, from, away from the craft of writing books to really important questions, and I, I apologise to the person because I can't see their name. What's your favourite snack while you write? <laughs> There's really, I love these questions. <laughs> these are the best questions, I tell you. When, you, when I do lots of school visits, um, I was once asked, what's your favourite Disney character? And that question has haunted me because I was really on the spot and I really wanted to think about it for a long time. So my favourite snack is um, biscuits, I think. I do love chocolate. Obviously, everyone loves chocolate. But I think um, I'm more of sweet. I have a sweet tooth. Not, I don't particularly eat crisps and things. So biscuits. And my favourite biscuits are custard creams and bourbons. They're my own. So I drink lots of tea and eat lots of biscuits. So if I eat lots of bourbons and um, custard creams, I'll be as good an author as you, do you think? You no. Yeah, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, look, I can, I can only dream of that. Um, have, uh, two sort of related questions. And again, mm -hmm. forgive me for the person who asked this. I can't find it. What are you reading at the moment? And also, more specifically, have you read any re children's books recently that you've really loved? Yeah. So I'm reading a book at the moment called um, It's About Bullet Journaling. So this is a non fiction book. Um, and 
a friend of mine has started well she i think she's used it for a while it's cool it's a way of organizing your diary what you, your to-do list keeping track of the books you've read keeping track whatever you want to do and i'm reading a book about how to do that um which is really really interesting because you can't see it but my desk is terrible i've got bits of paper everywhere i've got notebooks see i've got notebooks diaries i've got notes written on pieces of paper and i've got scraps of paper and i've just always always worked like that so i'm trying to put them all into a book so that's what i'm reading about how to do this and children's books that i've read recently i have read um a book by charlie higson which is due out this month now charlie higson is a comedian but he's also a really brilliant writer he's written the young bond books and I can't remember the name of the book. Worst Holiday Ever. That's what it's called. <laughs> and it was it made me cry laughing. That's brilliant. That's coming out soon. I've read um not oh, let me have a look on my bookshelf. That'd be the best way to do it. Um I've got lots to read. I have um Midnight Guardians. That's another good book. Midnight Guardians by Ross uh ross montgomery and that's a fantastic book i think that comes out later this month maybe maybe actually it might be more like autumn time um but i've got lots and lots of reading to do there's lots of books on my shelf you might be able to see behind me like bone talk by candy gawley i've heard brilliant things about that that sounds really really good and robin yeah. stevens i'm a big fan of her books i've got her latest one to read Oh, yes. Candy and Robin are both favourites at Barnes. We, we love them. Mm, um, yeah. and, and we're all uh, we're all been sitting here admiring your bookshelf, too. So thanks for that little insight in, in, into your I know. I, I think, yeah, I love looking at people's bookshelves. And um, so I thought it'd be nice if you can see it behind me. Yeah. And you can see the different because lots of countries change covers as well for books. And you can get to see how different they all look probably from there. Oh, <laughs> Two, we've got time for two really quick questions, and um, mm -hmm. we've got so many questions. Uh, I think we'll try and uh, send them over to you. Um, yeah. Um, this is a question that, that's been asked of a lot of people, and I think it's about inspiring all these amazing young authors that we've got mm -hmm. uh, down here, the, the inspiring, the aspiring. Uh, how long did it take you to get your first book published? Now, we've heard dozens mm -hmm. of, of, of drafts and dozens of publishers, but what was your story? So I wrote The Goldfish Boy, and as I mentioned, it took me years, really. I wrote those short stories, and then I decided one of those short stories could make a book. And then I worked on this book, and I got to the point where I thought, this is rubbish, nobody's going to read it, what am I doing? And then um, I eventually sent it to an agent, and I was really lucky, and I, he came back to me very, very quickly, and I got my agent really quickly so it took me a long time to write the book but the actual process of get, getting an agent and getting a book deal was quite quick for me even though it took me years to kind of write the book so I think okay. you, get, you do I did get rejections I don't don't get me wrong I didn't send it and got the first person I asked <laughs> um, but I set myself a deadline I, I allowed myself a year to do to try and get an agent and I managed to get an agent within that year Oh, well done. Yes, we've heard all sorts yeah. of different variations from first time lucky yeah. to, to look, it took years and years and years. So I think, yes. I think it's it's perspiration and dedication and getting up at 5 a.m., isn't it, Lisa? <laughs> it is. And I, I'm not kind of preach. I mean, I have a really bad attention span and I'm um, the per sort of person I start things and I don't finish them. So the fact that I've written one book is a miracle and to have written all these books is an even bigger miracle. So if I can do it, when I I easily drift off and do other things, I think anyone, you know, if you really want to do it, you will do it. Oh, Lisa, I just, uh, that thanks so much. I think it's been very inspiring to everyone. It's it's 10.30. I can't believe an hour has gone so quickly. <laughs> so really I just cool. want to give a few shout outs. Uh, I want to thank you to all the primary schools who've joined us. I noticed that Lionel Park, uh, Oak Farm, All Saints, um, a lot of schools have been attending. Thank you to all of them. Thank you for your teachers for bringing you along. Thank you for Demet. Oh, Demet, I'm so sorry. You must be lost in in, in um, Oxford over there. Something went, didn't quite go <laughs> right. The biggest thanks of all, though, Lisa, is to you. What a marvellous hour you. you've given us. Thank you so much for giving us an insight into, into yeah, your books and you. to you and to your bookshelf. 
<laughs> lovely thank you it's been so lovely to see you i'm going to look, read through the comments now which i've oh, yeah. turned off so it didn't distract me but thank you everybody thank you very much for joining me um i think there's a link that you can click on down yep. there to go to waterstones isn't there so yes, that's yeah right. it takes us through to the special barnes children's literature festival page set up by by waterstones and you can buy lisa's yeah. book there thank you so much everyone thank and you. Um, thank you. we've got lots of fun more events coming up uh, the rest of the day and over the weekend it's going to be lots of fun but this has been what a fantastic start to the day you've given us lisa thank Lovely. you so thank much you. and thank you, i'm Susie. going to i'm going to try and do some really really clever technical stuff there and there we go we can't make it work without our lovely partners and uh and uh and we're um let's see and we've made this festival free to watch because of the circumstances there is a little donation button down the bottom but uh just enjoy the festival thank you lisa thank you goodbye everybody thank you. bye